P25 Strategic Alliances. This course explores how organizations develop relationships with other firms in order to attain the resources that they need in order to create the products and services that they'll be selling to their either consumer uh, customers or their corporate customers. Before we jump into looking at the relationship specifically, I would like to take a couple of minutes and just give you a bit of an overview of the course. So as I mentioned, we're looking at how organizations interact with one another. So that might be a sport organization and a corporate partner, sport organization, a government organization, a sport organization, a broadcasting company, um, any types of buyers or suppliers. Um, so are all of these types of linkages the same? No, they're not. Organizations enter into exchanges, partnerships, and sometimes they actually purchase a key supplier, and we'll look into the details of when and why they might do this um, by vertically integrating. Um, and then we'll look more broadly at network forms of organizations. And then beyond that are very strategic networks called industrial districts. So those are the major types of linkages that we'll be looking at throughout the, the next seven lectures or so as we go through the different segments in this course. As we begin to look at interorganizational relationships, we're going to take a macro perspective. That means that we're going to look very, very broadly at the three key cornerstone organizations that are linked that provide the foundation of the sport industry. These are, of course, sport organizations, you might guess, broadcasting companies, and the third are corporate partners or corporate sponsors. This triad of organizations is referred to as either the sport media complex or the sport media nexus. So over the next few minutes, we're going to explore the importance of this sport media complex and how it influences the dynamics of the success and the goal achievement or achievement of the strategic objectives of each of those three types of organizations, sport, the media, and corporate partners. In this segment, we'll be talking about the benefits that are derived by each of those three broad types of organizations. We'll also be talking about the critical dependence that sport organizations in particular have on both corporate partners and broadcasting organizations. The concept of the sport media complex or nexus um, was derived by a gentleman by the name of Soot Jali, and this was back in 1984. It's interesting that he was actually a sociologist writing about a fundamental business or interorganizational uh, relationship uh, theory. However, this theory really predominates much of what we see in terms of relationships between sport and the media and corporate sponsors in particular. The key focus of Dr. Jolly's thesis was that the sport media nexus, as he called it, what focused upon the key symbiotic relationship between professional sports and the mass media that lies at the heart of the accumulation process within which sports are entrenched. In this view, it is advertising that provides the key economic function of the media and of sport. So let's just chit chat about that for a minute. So what he's saying here is that the economic uh, drivers for the mass media in particular means what are the major revenues that are derived by broadcasting companies. They come from having spectators watch television and then they sell those spectators to uh, advertisers. In the and that's really done on the form of ratings. So if you have a very highly rated show, then you can ge generate more revenues from your advertisers. So when we look back uh, historically at, you know, when we were first in radio and then in television, what were the key drivers to bring the largest audience possible that they could sell to advertisers? And the answer was sport. 
Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. Well, several reasons, but we'll cover a couple of them right now. So, first of all, I think many of you have, might have said to your roommates or family or friends, you know, don't tell me the score as you're running into the room because you've taped a television show and you want to be able to have the uncertainty of the outcome. And that is what sport brings almost more so than anything else that's broadcast on television. So watching television in real time captured key audiences that were then sold en masse to broadcasters. The accumulation process that Jolly spoke of is fundamentally critical to broadcasting companies. What it essentially says is that television companies are trying to generate the most lucrative audience that they can sell to advertisers. What does that? Sport. So maybe some of you can think back, you might have had this experience on your own where you're writing an exam, but there's a really important sport match that's going on, hockey, football, baseball, soccer, whatever, and you're missing it, but you've PVR'd it and you run home and your roommates are there and you say, don't spoil it. That's the value of sport to broadcasters because people want to either see it in real time or maintain the uncertainty of the outcome of the game. And this is what advertisers are, are this is why advertisers are attracted to television. So that is one of two, there's several elements why broadcasters love sport, but certainly that uncertainty of the game and that guaranteed uh, ability to attract an audience in real time is key, more so than and other television shows that it's okay if maybe someone tells you the outcome. It's okay if maybe you don't, you're not there for that critical, you know, goal. It's not going to be talked about around the, the coffee the next day uh, with your friends. So this is one fundamental reason why this accumulation process uh, between broadcasting and advertisers is so important. A second reason why sport is so important to the relationship between broadcasters and advertisers is because sport doesn't attract any audience. They attract a very lucrative audience. Now it's shifted over time and it certainly depends on the sport that you're watching. But at the time of Jolly in the 1980s, it was that key audience of young males between the ages of 25 and 40 who were very lucrative because they were buying. Okay, this was a time in their life, they're, they're renting their, for, they're buying or renting their first house, they're buying their first car, they're getting their first credit card, they're having children, they're, they have this disposable income because they finished university and they have a job. So sport attracted that young audience and today male and female audiences alike are, are, are really attracted to various types of sports that are broadcast on television and this was the key element it's not just any audience it's a lucrative audience that has a high discretionary income that sport brings to advertisers so if you're an advertising company like American Express like Ford um, like a banking company holidays trips uh, anything to do with children, uh, toys, um, you know, baby products. This is your target market that you're trying to sell to that sport will deliver to you. Now we're going to take a look at a diagram of the sport media complex. And of course it has the three pillars that I talked about, sport organizations, broadcasting companies, and corporate sponsors, advertisers. Now, in the middle of that, of course, is the general public. They are the buyers that are going to fuel everybody. They're the consumers who are watching television and they're watching sport on television and they're also going to be buying all those consumer products that are being advertised on television. Clearly, we can see the three main elements of that tripod, the media, sport, and advertisers. 
and it's actually referred to as a tripod because of the interdependent nature of each of these three different types of organizations. So how could advertisers promote their product without, radio, without the media, without radio or television? How would sport be able to promote itself or generate revenue if it wasn't broadcast on television or on the radio? Sport organizations are not only dependent upon the broadcasters for revenues through their broadcasting contracts, but the advertisers also purchase products produced by sport organizations. These might be stadium signage, it might be the naming rights for a stadium, it might be a promotion um, that's going on inside, uh, like a theme night that's done for Campbell Soups, um, you know, to promote their products inside a venue. So that relationship is, is key. Now, for sport, sometimes we think about professional sport, and I've alluded to that, but this could be Olympic sport, this could be pro wrestling, this could be the you know any type of sport at any level um, as long as it has that uncertainty of the future and the broadcaster knows that they can generate enough eyeballs to actually attract sponsors to generate the revenue that they need as we look at this diagram I almost wish that we could tilt it a little bit because it's often referred to as a tripod because of the high level of interdependence between the three main types of organizations. So where would sport be without the revenue from corporate partners and broadcasters? Where would broadcasters be without the tremendous number of eyeballs that they gain from that uncertainty of the sport product? And certainly advertisers need to sell their products and services services to consumers. So there's a high level of interdependence. And as we go through this course, we'll be talking about the nature of the relationship between these, these, these three, because what we've seen over time is that the interdependence is such that we've seen a high level of vertical integration. And that means that we've seen broadcasting companies actually purchasing sport franchises so they have guaranteed access to that content. You can look at the diagram and see at the very center of it is the general public. Those are the eyeballs that we're talking about that link all three organizations that are in that tripod. So it's you and I, it's all of our families, it's all consumers of television and of consumer products that are at the cornerstone of the relationship within the sport media complex. To further that point, Lever tells us that without cameras, major sport events would virtually have no meaning at all. Contemplate that. What would sport mean if we weren't able to consume it through the media? All right, so we've had an introduction to the, the macro concept of the sport media complex. Now we're gonna talk about the three main benefits that are provided specifically to sport organizations. The first benefit is the revenue that's generated from both broadcasters and corporate partners to sport organizations. So the billions of dollars in sport con in broadcasting contracts that are generated by the NFL, the NHL, Major League Baseball, the Olympic Games, those contracts are incredibly valuable. And on top of that, they also generate revenue from selling uh, contracts to corporate partners. The second main benefit for sport organizations is that being broadcast is essentially a fan building engine, right? Imagine being essentially broadcast for free. You're, you're attracting all of those eyeballs, you know, game in, game out, Olympics in every other year, billions if not millions of people are watching your games on television. And then they're buying all of your merchandise. They're following your athletes on social media. Your athletes are then influencers. And the extension of this um, as it perpetuates the revenue generating opportunities that are available for sport organizations. The third main benefit for sport organizations in the sport media complex 
is that it enables the relationship with corporate partners and able sport organizations to develop stronger relationships with fans and not only the say a pro sport franchise but its athletes or the Olympic athletes they're an extension of the franchise and they can then uh, have their own means to through social media or being on a on a broadcast ad so so I think one I think very prominent example of that would be Michael Jordan and and certainly we've heard that question so did Nike make Jordan or did Jordan make Nike you know who was the celebrity there what was the driving force there but what that relationship demonstrated was the importance of the athlete as an individual to driving consumers to purchase the products of advertisers and and how fans grew to feel closer to those athletes and then we've seen a further extension and strengthening of that through social media as as we can literally text and Twitter and write about our athletes and the athletes can write back and that of course strengthens all of those relationships that are fundamental to the sport media complex. So while there were positive impacts of the sport media complex for sport organizations, on the flip side, there are also some negative impacts. The main one being the control or increasing level of control over sport by broadcasting companies mainly, but corporate partners as well. So certainly if you're a broadcasting company, you want to be able to capture that large audience that we discussed. And so you need sport to be, uh, you know, played at a certain time. Um, so that means that rescheduling all of the games. So maybe that's not so hard for pro sport, but think about an Olympic athlete that might have to get up at four or three or two o'clock in the morning in their time what, that it is in their country to run a race where the actual Olympic games are being held. So there was a huge impact on the athletes themselves as well as on the sport organization. We also saw an increase in changes in the rules to make the games more exciting. For some sports, we even saw changes in the color of the ball so that it would be easier for people to view on television. So on an increasing basis, we saw these types of shifts. And of course, the sport organizations are seeing their revenue coming in from broadcasters. So when they ask for these types of changes, even though they might have had an adverse effects on the, in, on the athletes, they went ahead and made those changes anyway. So while we did see some negative impacts, certainly on the sport organizations and the changes that they had to make and on the athletes, and we would put that to the level of exploitation of those athletes in terms of some of the things that they were asked to do, the result was the increased attractiveness of sport for the fans. So by way of example, uh, we saw rule changes, uh, we saw close-ups, we saw camera replays, color commentary, all of these things that enhance the overall experience for the home viewer. And of course we saw the size of television screens, the nature of television screens, such that you can be a fan at home, but you're actually feeling like you're at the game. And all of this increased viewership and fan attention, which then increased the amount of revenue that sport was able to derive from their broadcasting contracts and from their corporate partners. So in sum, you can see the mutual benefits and the symbiotic relationships that evolved between sports, broadcasting companies, and corporate partners. So this figure is of the, the sport media complex value chain. So here we see the actual sport property going through broadcasting, corporate partners, and how that evolves right to the fan at the end of that value chain. So in conclusion, all of you in fourth year, you're going to graduate, you're going to be managing relationships with corporate partners, broadcasting companies, the fans, um, as, and anyone else that provides resources to your sport organization. So understanding the fundamental dynamic of the sport media complex gives you a sense of what do those relationships look like? How important are they? How much do we bend our organization to fit with the demands of those key critical partners that we're linked to? How do we choose those partners? Do you, vertically integrate. So if a resource is absolutely central 
um, to the experience of your end run consumer, do you buy that resource if it's a very unique resource that you must have? So in this course, you're going to learn a new terminology, a new language of interorganizational relationship. But central to that is understanding the key rationales to making the decisions about who to partner with and why, and, and what factors would you consider when you're making those kinds of decisions. So in the coming weeks, I look forward to sharing that information with you.